Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Shannon Derejo from Crema Media. Welcome to today's webinar on ESG in mining, where a panel will unlock ESG in South Africa's mining sector and the lessons we've learned. Today's webinar is sponsored by Harmony Gold, Partners in Performance, Rand Merchant Bank, Youth Employment Service, Digby Wells Environmental Consultants, and Aquasi Mining Services. We thank them for their support in making this webinar possible. Before we get started, please be aware that we've enabled the Q&A, so please post any questions into the Q&A box. You'll find that on the panel at the bottom of your screen. The panelists will answer as many of your questions as possible throughout the discussion. To encourage interaction, we've also enabled the chat function so you can network with the panelists via the chat box. You'll also find this at the bottom of your screen. Please don't post any questions in the chat though as we may miss them. Post all your questions into the Q&A instead. Please be aware we are recording this webinar and we'll be sending the recording to you when it's available. We'll also stream the webinar live to YouTube and we'll share that link when it's available. Today's webinar brings together thought leaders in the area of environmental, social and governance or ESG in order to deepen discussions, insights and best practice with regard to this vital issue for the South African mining sector. Today's webinar is facilitated by Sandra Dutoy from Partners in Performance. She heads the Partners in Performance Energy Transition Practice in Africa, aiding clients in their path to net zero emissions from project development to carbon credit utilization. Sandra will facilitate the discussion with our panel, which includes Melanie Naidu for Mark, Senior Executive for Sustainability and ESG at Harmony Gold, Sarah Cooper, the Group Sustainability Manager at Digby Wells Environmental Consultants, Joanne Bates, COO at the Industrial Development Corporation, Ravi Naidu, CEO of the Youth Employment Service, and Nigel Beck, Head of Sustainable Finance and ESG at Rand Merchant Bank. I'll hand over now to our facilitator, Sandra Dutoy, to continue with the proceedings. Over to you, Sandra. Um, thank you so much, Shannon. Um, thank you to our panelists. And most of all, thank you to the very large audience that's dialed in today to join us for this panel discussion. Melanie, you Harmony's Senior Executive for Sustainability and ESG. Over the last 20 years, you've held a number of key roles um, in leading international mining companies across the globe. You serve on various boards and trusts, um, including Harmony's own environmental trust. Maybe you can kick us off by just recapping for the audience. What are we talking about when we're talking about ESG in the mining sector? And before I ask you about Harmony as a company specifically, are you really still seeing a lot of pressure in the mining sector on ESG? Hi, Sandra, and hello to our listeners. So good to be on the panel. Yeah, Sandra, you just gave away my age, eh? two decades in the industry. But I must say in those two decades, um, what I can tell you is that ESG is not a fundamentally new concept to us, specifically not to our industry. I think in a large sense, we've been pioneers for responsible mining for decades now, ever since I've been in the industry. Uh, we've called it different things. We might have called it corporate responsibility or HSE or triple bottom line. But I think we have been doing uh, ESG or some elements of ESG for some time. Uh, you ask, what is ESG? I think if I had to really just distill it, it's it's really a business's commitment to running their affairs responsibly, um, to being sustainable, to leave lasting impacts. It's really about building trust with stakeholders, which we believe creates value, it creates legitimacy, and really vital for the company's sustainability in the long run. So, so, Sandra, whilst it's not a new concept, I think what is different is that these days, ESG has become front and center for many of our stakeholders, customers, uh, regulators, stock exchanges, financiers like Nigel, even our own employees and communities are keen to know that we run our business ethically and sustainably. And more than that, they really want to see our performance. So, yes, this, this does intensify pressure. Um, on our businesses. Uh, for example, investors want to know that we've internalized our ESG and are managing impact so that we can be robust and resilient for the future. Um, 
we talk to our employees. They want to know that their values accord with the values of the company that they work for and that our duty of care extends beyond our gates. And I think regulators too, you know, they want to know that they're supporting businesses um, that support national prosperity, that are good stewards. And, and all of these issues are starting to be linked to tenure. So indeed, the pressure's on. That said, I must say it is a good kind of pressure because it did help us. Um, it helps us shifting ESG from periphery or non-core and bringing it into mainstream. So, you know, lots of conversations being had in many boardrooms now about how we can do ESG best. So now that's just external pressure. I think there's other pressures as well. And I just want to touch on, on maybe one or two. Um, I think pressure from within business as well, internally, you know, we've we've seen this meteoric rise in ESG investments. And I think businesses have come to realize that it's very important to have a strong ESG proposition, to really articulate what we mean um, by being um, by being purpose driven, um, and I think we realize that if we have that strong proposition, we can be competitive. We could have a competitive advantage. Um, we could be value accretive. We could also be a differentiator within our industry. And I think this too is sort of creating a good pressure um, and a drive for change. So, so that's another form of pressure we're seeing. And I, I think the last pressure point that I want to just maybe mention is from within the industry itself. I know from the ICMM has said it on numerous occasions, um, trust in our industry is at its lowest. And we really have to work exceptionally hard to change those perceptions. Um, and you know our industry, you know, we're very proud, we're purposeful. We want to change this narrative. We want to build that lasting, enduring legacy. And I think that too uh, places an impetus on us as corporates to start taking a very deliberate and directed and responsive approach to ESG. So yes, Isha, but I think it's, it's very welcome for pressure and I think it's helped us to really mainstream ESG. So we've embraced it as the industry. Melanie, I, I love that introductory remark that you made, which is really that it is almost the embedded fabric of how you run your business um, holistically. Um, and so, Sarah, you are the executive for sustainability services. I'm not going to give away your age, but I'm going to say that you've got over 17 years of ESG and sustainability experience. And um, you were also at one stage seconded to Barrick Gold as a group sustainability and corporate affairs manager. Um, and you've been around various initiatives, including the World Gold Council's ESG task force um, and the IMMC working group that, that Melanie's referred to. Um, so the question I want to ask you, and you might want to get ready by just unmuting yourself, is having heard Melanie's introduction, and with your background and experience, what are the key elements of an effective ESG strategy um, in South Africa's mining sector? Sure. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Sandra. And uh, particularly thanks for not giving away my age. I'm pretty sure the glasses and the uh, graying hair does that in itself. Um, you know, I think regardless of where, where you are, you know, from South Africa to South America, the most effective ESG strategy is going to be one that focuses on those aspects that are most material to your business and that link to your overall vision. You know, everything, everywhere, all at once, fantastic movie, terrible ESG strategy. Um, you know, it's not going to get you anywhere. You need to understand your risks, your impacts, prioritize and develop a strategy that speaks to the biggest ones and your opportunities first. Um, then just to zoom out a bit, I was at a conference in London a couple of months back. Discussion there was around how ESG is perhaps now better reimagined as GSE, so um, putting governance first, particularly in the African context. And, you know, I agree with that. Um, governance is your foundation. It's how you make your decisions, how they happen, who, what, when, and why. Um, aspects, you know, ESG aspects need to be part of daily thinking and by discussion at all levels of management. Um, policies, procedures, processes you build create frameworks for everything else to manage. Um, you know, and then just to link it back to South Africa a bit, um, where we're dealing with impacts from grey listing, 
um, increased red tape that comes with that, robust governance standards, procedures, get you ahead of the curve when you're trying to deal with international markets. Um, so that's a win, and that reflects how ESG can de-risk and add value, and therefore should be part of business as usual, as Melanie said. And then my other point would be, don't let, let the S be silent. Um, you know, to operate in South Africa is to operate in a hugely diverse society, one with massive disparity. So social from stakeholder engagement, community development, investment, that's critical. Um, if you don't get your social license to operate right, you're in for a tough time and you're not going to get very far. Um, and you don't have to think too hard or too long to come up with examples of where a company hasn't got the social right and the consequences are massive. Um, you know, and I think that criticality of social is recognised in South Africa. I mean, at Digby Wells, social and stakeholder engagement teams are biggest um, and they're in high demand. Um, and then finally, I'd say just sound check yourself against the questions you're getting from your stakeholders um, and against those three and four letter acronyms that plague ESG, um, you know, climate and nature, TCFD, TNFD, all been launched with a hell of a lot of buzz. Um, and then the other one is impact. You know, view of ESG has shifted from risk management to impact management, how you're managing negative impacts, but also delivering positively. And that sort of links back to what Melanie was saying about telling the story right. And that's one of my favorite topics, um, but I'll hand over again. Thank you, um, Sarah. At the risk of sounding like um, like Oprah Winfrey um, in a webinar as opposed to a chat show, um, don't let the S be silent. Um, that is just um, such a resonating statement. So, Joanne, I'm going to move over to you. Um, you're a CA, again, with a two-decade-long career at uh, IDC. And you've played many roles across that organization, right? So at the moment, you're optimizing operations, managing emergency funding responses, promoting um, sustainability um, in alignment with development goals. Um, and you've got a very rich history in finance, um, including the Moselle transaction in Mozambique and roles at HSBC and APSA Capital. So you've just about seen the good, the bad and the ugly um, in financial services um, around sustainability. So linking on to the sort of backdrop that's been set by Melanie and by Sarah, how has ESG um, influenced IDC's investment policy? And how are you guys rolling this in to mining-related investments um, in your portfolios? Thanks, Sandra, and thanks for including us, uh, the IDC today, because I think this is such an important conversation. From an IDC perspective, we've reformulated our responsible investment policy, looking at incorporating, I'm going to say ERSG, because resilience is a critical component of focus to ensure that we build resilient communities and resilient businesses while delivering on ESG principles. And the responsible investment policy is owned by operations, not by risk for the key reason that we see responsible investment as a key opportunity to fundamentally shift the South African economy and to grow sustainable, green, resilient value chains in South Africa. Um, from a mining perspective, uh, there obviously is the, you know, the, the coal, the reducing coal appetite. So we still do provide funding to coal mines associated with existing supply. Um, but we are concerned about the fundamentals in the, the coal industry. You know, we have companies um, wanting to grow to support the, the global north in their emergency supplies, which we think is far too short-termist. So our principle from an ESG and responsible investment perspective is to look at the 25-year growth potential of the economy around the key pillars of governance, critical for transparency, proper management, proper insight, proper oversight, proper um, management of both businesses and resources, 
um, environmental, ensuring that we build resilience, the communities that are impacted, that our partners operate uh, responsibly uh, and consider their impact on the environment in all that they do. There's a cobalt, uh, there's been a lot of questions raised around cobalt and mining practices around cobalt, which is now resulting in innovation to find replacements for cobalt. So we need to be thinking not about how do we support a mine that is operational today in a resource that is relevant today, but what are the relevant resources for the future and ensuring that those resources can be mined in a socially and environmentally responsible manner. Uh, from an IDC perspective, you know, we were started to, um, to establish our steel and, and petrochemicals industry. Um, so we have got a horrible balance sheet from an environmental perspective, um, but a very strong social bent because that is core to our mandate um, in inclu creating inclusive businesses and driving sustainable jobs. And our commitment is not to decarbonize and to have e good ESG principles on our balance sheet. So we end up with a lovely portfolio of ESG compliant clients, but really to ensure that we have, that we create the, um, the, the opportunity for companies to be responsible corporate citizens in the country, be they small or large, because we only create an ESG compliant um, and differentiated economy and resilient economy if we ensure that we transition all of the companies that are currently operating. So with our existing mining clients, it's very much a case of how can we support them in um, social um, impact opportunities. So we work with the impact catalyst uh, and there's conversations with the impact catalyst around um, you know, regional um, SED plans. So how do we think about impact, as was said earlier, as opposed to just compliance? And then from an environmental perspective, how do we enable clients to provide them with financial support to decarbonize their operations and reduce their business risk and investment risk. And then critically in the mining industry, how do we unlock the mineral pathways that exist in the, in the metals of the future? Because that is where we believe that it's not just a case of mining those metals, but mining it in a way that makes them globally competitive because of the sustainable practices on which they are developed. Thanks. And thanks so much. I think that's given us a, a lot of thought, um, food for thought. And I think, Shannon, for next year's panel, we can uh, challenge ourselves to change it to an ERSG um, sustainability webinar. Um, but Nigel, staying with the guys with the, the big wallets and the deep pockets attached to those big wallets, um, you are RMB's Sustainable Finance and ESG Advisory Leader. Um, your CV says you're an African sustainable finance pioneer, but I remember you vividly calling yourself the only hippie walking around investment banking in the days when sustainability was only equator principles. Um, so at the moment, you're steering that equator principles committee and um, you lead at the IC, uh, International Chamber of Commerce, Sustainable Trade Finance, and you're part of the Impact Investing um, National Task Force. So can you help us complete that picture that Joanne has started sketching? And that is just the role of sustainable finance and how actually that sustainable financing is linking up to ESG and how that is supporting investment um, in the mining industry in South Africa. Sure, thanks, Sandra. Um, so first of all, what, what did you say? ERSG, I don't think I can do another acronym in this industry. So a combination between the banking industry and the environmental industry with regards to acronyms. I think I'm all out of acronyms. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I've been in the space, as you know, for, for probably 20 years. And, you know, to some degree, I consider myself an original. There's, there's this film about vampires where there's five vampires that bite all these other vampires and the five original guys are called the originals. So, you know, um, as well as I do, there's been some hard yards, as you say, um, in banking when we used to work together many, many years ago, um, when ESG wasn't the flavor of the month and it wasn't particularly popular and I probably wasn't particularly popular as well. And I remember the comment you're talking about walking around in Hessian sacks, and I think it was Paul Ronquist that came up with that that uh, description of myself. Um, anyway, so I think if, if we look at kind of ESG considerations and how they've been impacting, you know, impacts on investment within the, within the mining industry, and I think Melanie mentioned it earlier, 
So environmental and social aspects have always been relevant in the mining industry. You know, there's been this kind of social license to operate. There's the need for these environmental permits. There's SLPs. I remember when I first joined banking in 2008, and obviously I was exposed to a lot of different kind of sectors, working closely with the mining sector. I always felt that the mining sector was quite advanced and quite aware of kind of ESG requirements, even if you compare it to other extractives. So if you compare it to the oil and gas sector, I was always surprised how actually the oil and gas sector wasn't up to speed with ESG in 2008 uh, as kind of the mining sectors. What we have seen or what I have seen is there's been an evolution. So there's been an evolution from kind of compliance, a focus on permits to a focus on kind of risk management where you would look at kind of social un unrest or how do you manage contamination events or uh, um, prevent contamination events and now more towards kind of business opportunity. So kind of looking at how do you use sustainable finance to raise debt? How do you use that to raise capital? Sometimes at preferential rates and sometimes at increased limits. So, you know, if we look at the, the sustainable finance opportunity globally, it's a massive market globally. I think it's about, it was $1.7 trillion in 2021. Um, in Africa, I think we are 0.5% of that. So we're a very, very small portion of that kind of sustainable finance market. Um, we are kind of playing catch up with, with with kind of the rest of the world. But if you speak to a lot of um, uh, lawyers internationally, basically they say they very rarely structure a vanilla instrument these days. Almost all the instruments that they structure have some type of sustainable finance element to them. So you can see this is really the direction of travel and, and the way the world's going. So historically, you know, ESG considerations and investments have always been around, do you have the relevant permits? You know, is there a specific reputational risk with that specific mining company or that operations? If it's a project finance, is it aligned to the equator principles or the IFC performance standards? But I think what we're starting to see increasingly coming from both banks and investors is this climate lens, you know, this climate lens around net zero. A lot of the banks, a lot of the investors, institutional investors have made commitments around net zero. So therefore, they're obviously pushing that through the system and they're pushing that onto their clients. So trying to understand where your clients are on their transition journey. So in other words, what commitments have they made? Have they made net zero commitments? Are they science-based? Um, are they reporting according to TCFD? You know, and the reason for this is to try and understand as a financial institution, what are the absolute emissions of, of these companies? Um, and what is the intensity? So we can do peer comparisons. So banks and investors are increasingly doing kind of peer comparisons across um, emissions intensity, but also to look at the financed emissions of a bank's portfolio. So, you know, increasingly banks are looking at your financed emissions. You know, there's essentially a financed emission envelope and you need to understand which clients are you going to bring in and out of that type of envelope. And that's going to be a scarce resource, very much like capital will be financed emissions. And then I, I think increasingly, and I think, you know, we'll probably discuss this a little bit later, but the opportunity side, you know, what is the, how do banks look at, you know, the preference and the appetite towards green lending, um, green loans, sustainable finance products, sustainability linked lands that essentially uh, enable the transition and, and, and support banks' commitments to this. Those are all the different aspects that are coming into how banks look at uh, investments in the mining space. Thanks, Nigel. And I'm, I'm so glad you, you started alluding to the greenwashing concept because we definitely are going to talk about that a little bit later on in the webinar. And it's also a question that have, has come up from the audience. Um, but before we, we um, delve into that, Ravi, um, you are the unsilencing of the S. Um, you're the CEO of the Youth Employment Service. You've got over 25 years experience there. You've beaten all of us. Um, in social impact programs, um, you collaborate with a lot of industries on, on how to benefit South Africans. Um, and you also serving on the National Planning Commission for long term growth. I'm most jealous of you being a Harvard graduate. Um, but I think second would probably be um, having been part of establishing the SA National um, Green Fund. So tell us about YES um, and tell us about how that youth employment service is actually helping mining companies to operate um, more sustainably. Um, and if you've got any great success stories that you could share with us, that, that would really be encouraging this afternoon. All right. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Sandra. So, you know, I think um, maybe just to go back to the 
point of uh, yes and uh, 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 ESG and sustainability. You know, we we have over the last few years focused a lot about what business can do to deal with uh, risk and how you know its own actions is quite material. But I think what we see now is we are very much in an environment where a uh, situation where your total uh, environmental social governance environment, the business operating environment uh, that we have is very material for the business itself. So in other words, if you have very high levels of, of uh, youth unemployment and social instability, it's a very material in- issue for you as a business. And you can see it in, for instance, you know, when we engage with corporates in South Africa, it's really the wider socioeconomic issues which are front and center in their decisions. So I think the, the way in terms of how, yes, the Youth Employment Service was actually uh, set up, it was to deal with the fact that there is a much broader um, environmental uh, materiality. And I mean, obviously, not just the green environment. I just mean, um, you know, the risks that are out there that are really uh, quite key. So with that risk in mind, then what, what happened is the CEO initiative, the private sector set up a program on youth employment for the private sector. So yes, it was set up as a partnership program effectively uh, by the private sector uh, for the private sector. And the idea is let's really get as many young people as possible um, who have potential but coming from really the poorest backgrounds, get them into the economy, uh, become a talent pipeline, um, and and really broaden the base, the economic base of the country, and in that way begin to at least uh, uh, mitigate some of the broader uh, material risks which obviously the environment poses to businesses. And that was a thing that really prompted this collective action uh, from from uh, business. So in a sense, we 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 part of a uh, as you say the S of the ESG and our, it's it's a collective response by a business in South Africa to try to deal with that social impact, but it's really also dealing with the material risk, which is coming through uh, from that. Um, and I think, so therefore it's an interesting, you know, sort of case study of how it's gone in the last few years. The program is about four years old and we've uh, supported now 126,000 uh, youth uh, into jobs, 12 months, minimum wage, um full time it's the biggest program of its kind public or private in the country uh for that and we've managed to uh, pull together about 1600 sponsoring corporates so that it's entirely funded by the private sector and it's a couple of billion rand of stipends internships really that are um funded and you know we so we 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 have found that uh more and more businesses are realizing that you know the broader socioeconomic issue is a material uh, risk for them, and therefore that is a reason to join. But you know what we've also had to do is think about how we layer the program because um, even though we know CFOs understand materiality and will and will and will understand that, but the but it's also important when we position it to corporates that, like for example, in mining, that you know this program also. Um, can support your social labor plans. So how you stack up the different benefits. So clearly, if if you are supporting youth um, into jobs in the towns, small towns, and you are looking at, for example, as a corporate, you know, for every one mining job, you're under pressure to create five non-mining jobs. You would work with us in terms of supporting uh, the creation and development of these non-mining jobs to the extent that you want to um, structure sustainable community programs. Again, you'd work with us because then you're trying to look at how you bring the employment, the SME uh, components into that, and in so doing, you know, giving some uh, some alignment to the mining charter and your obligations to the company. So what we've done, we've been working with companies. Um, so even though I would I would have to say that mining is still the smallest components uh, of of the ES program. Um, so we've done, like I said, 126,000 in the last couple of years, and 5,000 of those are mining jobs. We worked with you know, Amplat, South 32, all of that, and really taking youth from their uh, jurisdictions and putting them into uh, non-mining jobs, cybersecurity jobs, uh, web design jobs, electricians, 
I think with uh, Joanne there, we are doing drone pilots uh, supported by the IDC, and they fly these drones over these small towns, um, and they can also help build other industries like tourism and uh, you know property management, uh, local government programs, and so. On. So it's, so we so we 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 we've had to uh, try to integrate uh, this into uh, social aid plans, which I think has gone reasonably well. Um, now, the main reason why companies join YES is obviously you get those two levels up on your BE. So if you join YES, and let's say you're, you're a level six company and you meet your targets, you can go from level six to level four if, if we verify that you have actually met whatever the uh, youth internship program uh, requirements are. But we're then finding what's uh, above, apart from uh, uh, BE and social labor plan, now, one of the other things that's becoming a big issue, of course, is just pure employment equity because, you know, you need your your, your junior staff and you need your uh, senior staff or their targets uh, for all industries, not just mining. Obviously, mining has its 60% its 70% targets uh, that it has to meet. And uh, But what we're finding is that companies would be recruiting uh, young people and putting them into the programs part of a five-year plan. So that's another thing. And we've had to also then think about, all right, so if if you are employing youth and you're putting them, uh, you know, if you're employing a uh, woman and you're putting her into a, uh, setting up her own business, but the business is really solar PV to support the local mining towns, you are actually hitting a number of sustainable development goal uh, targets because it's women, small business, it's environment, solar PV, so now we are generating uh, from our same program, you know, measurable outcomes for, for these companies that they take to the Nigel Becks and RMBs of the world and the asset managers as part of their sustainability report that show, okay, you put in so much into the different SDG, uh, SDG goals and so on. So, it's, so we're really finding that, and then so, so the number of people coming through our program has already been growing about, about 20 to 30% a year. And the number of companies joining has really been also growing quite substantially. Uh, as I say, mining is one of the uh, the smallest sectors for us, but it's also uh, you know it's got its own challenges as a sector. But but we we are finding that the, there is a stronger understanding now of, of the broader socioeconomic environment posing a a very material risk for businesses, which collectively now through programs such as this and the other programs as well that should be created. They, they, they are beginning to engage. So let me just stop there as my initial thought of that question. No, Ravi, thank you so much. And I think um, it's a very uh, delicate but direct call to arms for our participants on the on the webinar today to say if your company is not already signed up to the YES program, then you should go and challenge the decision makers as to why not. Um, Melanie, I'm going to start feeding in some of the questions um, from the audience. And we've got a question from Clint Hill, um, which is an interesting challenge given what we've heard from everybody in the introduction. And he is asking that within the South African mining environment, where we've got SLPs, MCSC, Triple BEE, EIAs, or the three and four letter and five letter acronyms as mandatory regulatory requirements, why would we now take note of all of the great things that we've been talking about this afternoon that is actually not a regulatory requirement or a legal deliverable against measurable targets? Or are the other things super priorities over and above, as you have stated it, the way you run your business? Mm. Um, thank you, Sandra, and thank you to you, Clint, for that question. I think it really just boils down to what your operating philosophy is. Um, but before I get there, I just want to say I don't think that um, the legal instruments are mutually exclusive to what we want to achieve and what we want to do. I think it boils down to your philosophy. Um, and, and like I said at the very onset, you know, many mining companies, many industries are starting to look at what their impact is and their impact beyond compliance. 
Um, and in a country and in jurisdictions that we operate in, I think there is a moral obligation for us to actually work collaboratively, collectively. I'm embarrassed, Ravi, that I'm not a part of your process and program, so I'm going to be partnering with you after this call. Um, but I think that if you have set yourself up as an institution in an organization that really wants to make impact, really wants to be purposeful, really wants to be a part of solutions and drive change where you operate, um, and I think Joanne had said it very eloquently, build your robust and resilient business, but build your resilient communities with you, then I don't think we should be limited. I don't think companies like us will be limited by legal instruments. I think we're lim I think we're expanding our scope well beyond that. I think we understand we have a role to play that goes beyond compliance. Um, and I think that's where many businesses are positioning themselves right now. Many businesses that have roots and commitments um, and obligations and, and a moral basis to want to do more are actually doing more. I hope that answers you and Glenn, Sandra. Thank you so much, Melanie. Uh, that, uh, it really is um, compelling. And I think we're going to circle back to, you know, ESG not just having stick, uh, but actually having having a big carrot element um, to it as well. Um, Sarah, just as we start sort of getting more granular in terms of thinking around the implementation um, of all of the measures that, uh, that our panelists have been talking about so far at the moment, um, you know, is there a one size um, fits all solution for ESG? especially when companies are operating in multiple jurisdictions. And perhaps you can also help Marshall Maswabi, who has asked if he would like to understand the difference of having all of these ESG strategies compared to, for example, um, ISO principles around operational health and safety, which is um, usually done by um, the SHE officers. And I think the question is really around the breadth of the scope um, of what we um, as a panel have been discussing as being um, included um, in ESG. Yeah, sure. Um, easy question, hey? Um, yeah, you do need a group level strategy. Um, but again, it's got to focus on the material, um, those priorities. But it, instead of sort of being too specific, um, it almost needs to be, you know, thematic guidance or framework for achieving some ambitions in your key pillars that that you've identified as a priority. Um, but then, you know, the, the other part is, you know, like anything, the devil's in the detail. How you achieve your goals can and does look different depending on where you're operating. Um, so, you know, you take your strategy as an overarching framework, but then you need to develop context-specific implementation plans to achieve it. Um you know, and I'll give you an example. So um, if you've got a group focus to reduce your greenhouse gas emissions, build resi climate resilience, um, depending on where you're operating, that's going to vary. If you're somewhere um, that's got easy access to a national grid and a stable grid um, or, or not a, an unstable grid, um, no, <laughs> let me start again. Operations without easy access to a stable national grid um, you're probably going to rely on generators. Um, so the what your pathway towards reducing your emissions would be, you know, pretty easy, not easy, but start looking at towards renewables. Whereas if you're operating somewhere where you have a stable national grid, um, your pathway to achieving those reductions could be something like, you know, and depending on the energy mix of that grid could be, you know, looking at power purchase agreements and, you know, using your purchasing power to... Um, influence a national grid and, and change your emissions there. Um, so, like I said, you know, if you've got to achieve, achieve the same goal, how you're going to get there is going to look different in each place. Um, that strategy sets out what's important, provides those thematic tools, um, you know, so it could be by investing in renewables, using our purchasing power, investing in R&D, um, and that gives your, your team space to own it, to implement your strategy um, in the most suitable way for the operating context. Um, a strategy, you know, versus ISO, I, those things will come in as part of, of what you're doing. You know, if you're wanting to have ISO 14001, 45001 for health and safety, 
Um, you might say, well, you know, these provide the process that we can do that through. Um, it's a good way to get assurance. It's, um, you know, will help with lowering insurances, all those kind of things. It's not one or the other. They're all fused together and, and work together well. Yeah. Thank you, Sarah. And I think that's a theme in, in quite a lot of the questions um, that I'm sort of seeing coming through from the audience is really about this wide umbrella that all fits under ESG, but actually has a whole host of other traditional roles, um, responsibilities, pieces of legislation, as Melanie helped us to, to kind of fit into the bigger pieces of the puzzle all playing into either being drivers, being tests, being standards, or, or being reporting issues. Um, and I think it would be super interesting for somebody one day to go and draw up that map of the, the wide body of disciplines that goes into ESG um, and how all of the different standards feed into that. And so, Joanne, that, that kind of takes us back to you, right? Because... ESG um, for all of the different components that we can can pack and fit into that three or four letter acronym, so including resilience. Why is it so important for there to be a holistic focus on all of these elements um, as opposed to um, an exaggeration of uh, one or the other based on, on maybe current sentiment or as we've seen in the past when we've had mind tragedies, there's a sudden focus on safety. Why is it that we need to have this much bigger picture? Thanks. And I think uh, it was partly, I think, it addressed in, um, in an earlier comment that was made by my, Melanie on this you know, move away from compliance. So it's not about complying with any one pillar. Uh, we can really see this ESG approach as a tick, tick box, box exercise. It's prioritized which element is important to us or as a mechanism for triggering dynamic change in the business and the way we do things. And we really do advocate for a holistic approach. Uh, if we focus on any one pillar or prioritize any one part, you end up with unintended consequences. And I think it's really critical that we think about the entire system that we are trying to solve for in making the decisions that to prioritize what's important for the business. And you, it's, it, it's impossible to separate environmental from social impact. I mean, now, now, often make the comment in uh, about the Mpumalanga just transition. Why should a worker need to choose between air that they can breathe or a job that they can wake up and go to? You know, th those are, are not decisions that we should be creating um, you know, polarized opportunities on. We need to be thinking about the system and how we actually generate um, sustainable practices for our businesses. Um, we really do think, well, I really do think that we need to look at how we can understand the interrelated pieces, um, moving away from the tick, tick box exercise again. So we need to rehabilitate a mine. Um, so we can tick the box and we can have rehabilitated the mine. We need to comply with um, ESD and SED funding. We tick the box, we put the money out the door. But if we think about how we can use our ESD and SED funding to create sustainable agricultural enterprises that rehabilitate the land, provide food security to the, the workers um, in the community and um, in the mine, allows us to have an impactful outcome of the tick boxes that we've achieved. So that's why to me it's impossible to think about any one piece in isolation. We have to view this as, and it's greater than any individual company. I mean, I've often made the comment uh, to, you know, to slipping green hydrogen, which is a critical component of decarbonization. One of the most interesting parts of the green hydrogen conversation, it was, it was easy because the partners having the conversation were not from the same industry. But it was a highly collaborative conversation about how we can do something for the benefit of the country. And I really do think that within the mining space, we need to be thinking about how we drive impact as a collective, as opposed to how we do things alone. Um, so I really do think that we need a holistic approach for an individual mine, and that needs to fit within the system in which they operate to ensure that we do achieve that positive impact potential. Thanks. Thanks so much, Joanne. 
Melanie, you you are the most popular panelist today, so I'm going to swing right back to you. <laughs> um, we're getting quite a few questions um, from the audience um, in terms of the sustainable development goals um, as opposed to components of ESG um, with some of the sentiment behind the questions. Um, so I'm looking, for example, at a question from Elias Matinde um, that we've got um, in the chat group, kind of really looking to that lasting impact. So if you wouldn't mind getting a bit more specific with us, um, what lies at the core of Harmony's own ESG strategy? How do you measure the success of that strategy? And maybe if you can help us understand in that strategy how you guys were thinking about the SDGs um, and maybe um, even give us a few examples. The, the, the audience has been wondering about tailings management. Uh, they've been wondering about um, SMEs and, and those kinds of things. And I know it's now a whole bunch of questions, um, but, uh, but maybe we can... Uh, it's not okay to speak about um, birds and stones on a on an ESG webinar, right? So, so maybe if we can tick a few boxes in one go. Oh, it's not okay to talk about ticking boxes either. So, Melanie, if you can maybe help us answer a few questions in one go. I must say, um, Sandra, you threw about 17 at me, so I'm going to try and unravel it. If I've missed anything, please just lead me back to it. Welcome. Uh, maybe, maybe I'm just going to start with our ESG strategy, and it's not too dissimilar to what has been covered by Sarah and, and what um, Joanne had said. But really, for us, I think our strategy is linked to our philosophy. Um, that mining is transformational for both people, planet, and profits. Um, that if we do ESG right, we can solve global problems and we can deliver value for our business at the same time. So, so I think that's the philosophy. Um, responsible stewardship is one of our key strategic pillars, Sandra. And, you know, we've got four strategic pillars. This is the first of four. So that's how much of significance we place on it. Um, and I've already discussed that golden thread that links our purpose to strategy to operating model. Um, but I think what I really want to say about it is that our ESG strategy looks at a couple of things. Uh, it looks at how we manage down our risk, because we know that ESG risks erode value and you don't want to erode value. You want to build businesses out for the long term. It looks to unlock opportunities like uh, Nigel had said, but opportunities internally as well to create value to bottom line. Um, and it's it's about impact. And I think that's where the SDGs come in. How do we create impact? How do we create value? How can we share that for the betterment of shareholders and society? Um, and we've just come out of our reporting cycle and we've just come out of our ESG strategy. And I think there's a fundamental focus on aligning our strategy um, and our sustainable development or ESG framework to the SDGs, because whilst we know that the SDGs are there as a framework to guide and to lead um, governments and, and, uh, and other sectors towards success, mining has a massive role to play. I think we are a catalyst that can deliver many of these imperatives that we're trying to achieve with SDGs. Um, so again, you know, um, I think that there's quite a bit of a confluence between what a mining company can do within its ESG strategy and how it can support in unlocking and delivering um, the the um, the SDGs. So so there's a really a, a high degree of dovetailing and, and, and intertwining. Um, we've prioritized a couple of those um, SDGs within our business already. Um, looking at poverty alleviation, job creation, empowerment, building up um, a more resilient society, supporting in, in those aspects, the energy, the clean uh, energy, water management. Um, there's a host of those SDGs that sit within our ESG strategy. Um, and they're the ones that we have a direct 
uh, influence on delivering and unlocking it. Then there are the rest that we indirectly influence and support. So I do think that mining businesses, mining companies, most industries have absolute ability to link the ESG um, strategies to delivering against these. Um, you've asked me, how do we measure success? Uh, yeah, like, that's, a, that's a very difficult question. Um, you know, there's a plethora of reporting frameworks and standards and rating agencies and indices out there. And it tends to complicate that reporting landscape. So what we've done is, and we've looked inwardly, we've looked to our own material issues and targets and objectives we set for ourselves against those 13 priorities, against the SDGs. Um, and we look at how we perform against those objectives. And, and we're doing very well then. We report on that in our um, annual reports. Um, and those reports get reviewed by external parties. So we also look and place some reliance on how the external environment views our business, particularly from a, a performance perspective. And we look at the scores that we've received from ESG rating agencies, for example, brag moment, Sandra, I must take it. Um, Harmony holds a leadership position on the FTSE for Good ESG index. You know, we're, we feature in the top 95th percentile. We're in the top 50 for sustainability. And there's many other accolades that we celebrate. Um, and I think all of those talk to how we measure success. Uh, but most importantly, and, and it's a less tangible, less um, quantitative, possibly more qualitative measure that we use um, to measure success is, you know, how do we perform by our stakeholders? Um, and we largely measure this in the strength of the relationships that we've built, uh, the levels of trust, the levels of support and acceptance that we get from that collective stakeholder base that I spoke about earlier. And we test this. We test it often through acquisitions and, and the support that we've had from our host communities and our regulators and our unions in securing tenure. We test it in the relationships that we have with our financial institutions. We recently had to test it, Nigel, when we went out to secure sustainability-linked loans. Um, and I don't think we would have had the success that we've had had we not been able to deliver to our ESG ob obligations, to our ESG strategy, and to supporting these stakeholders in taking them forward uh, in line with, with what we um, commit to delivering as part of those SDG goals. So I hope that I've answered most of it. You've asked me to talk about... Um, Tailings, SMNEs. I'm happy to do it now. I could do it later on in the discussion, Sandra. Um, thanks, Melanie. I, I've I've received some very interesting um questions from the audience, which I can spin into 17 test factors for Nigel Beck as well. Um, and I would like to reference specifically questions from Tabiling um Motabi and, and Karen Nodia. So Elon Musk um, and his views on ESG um, feature quite prominently um, in, in those questions with Karen saying, um, Elon Musk says ESG is literally uh, the devil um, and referencing um, people like um, Trump as the US president and the actions that they might um, take to officially dismantle ESG, and then um, some institutional investors, um, and uh, Tabi Ling here refers to Larry Fink at BlackRock, um, Black Street, Vanguard, and a few of those, you know, kind of removing um, ESG funds or closing funds, which then has a knock-on um, with regulators actually beginning to define articulate and regulate um, ESG a lot more heavily. So do you think that there is benefit um, in global regulators actually trying to unpack what Melanie, um, I think, has very elegantly laid out for us as um, a far more moral concept, Melanie, if I, if I can use that term? You know, is the answer in terms of concretizing a framework and setting standards and those kinds of things, more legislation 
um, and more regulation to actually try and, and create a box around this thing um, or to, to embed it further or, or is the answer um, the opposite and, and more kind of broad goals and the opportunity for companies to, to say how they would like to support those broad goals? Who's that question for me or who's somebody else? For you, Nigel, for you. <laughs> You're not going to escape it on this platform. <laughs> so I, I think let's, it's first of all, let's unpack some of the things. So, so Musk, in his view on ESG, his issue with ESG is around ESG ratings. So the various ESG ratings companies um, have not rated Tesla particularly high because they look at it across a number of different spectrums. They look at it across environmental, social governance. It doesn't necessarily look at the impact of the specific company itself, which is obviously producing electric vehicles. And he feels that that should be, get, be given, I guess, a greater weighting in how you look at these. Whereas you might have, for example, carbon or fossil fuel intensive companies getting an ESG rating that's particularly high, and they're not necessarily producing a product that's in line with the transition. So that's where he's coming from. Um, with his with his criticism around ESG, and to be honest, I can somewhat sympathise with what he what, what his view on that. You know, I think to some degree there's been this kind of um, evolution of ESG ratings agencies. It is somewhat of a business. Um, I, I remember in the old, old days it was very much Sustainalytics, ISS, ESG. That's obviously evolved into much more S and P, MSCI, also doing this kind of ESG ratings, and all the methodologies are quite different. So. You know, you can have a specific company that scores high on one and low on another, which is not ideal. You know, not very similar to a credit rating, you know, your credit rating should be very similar um, across the different ratings agencies. So I think there needs to be done some, some work on that. And, you know, that leads to this level of, of criticism. With regards to Trump, I mean, I think Trump, what he's obviously trying to do, he's trying to create a narrative around ESG and, and almost discredit ESG as part of his presidential campaign. Um, and, you know, that also links into the greenwashing. I think he sometimes used greenwashing to his benefit. Um, but it also talks to kind of um, the issues that we're starting to see. So Larry Fink and uh, BlackRock and, and the likes who traditionally have been very outspoken around ESG. In other words, they said they're really going to drive an ESG strategy. They're going to drive. I mean, I used to use that in a lot of my pitches to clients. Well, you know, Larry Fink and these investors are all over this. Now I've got, it's, it's a bit awkward. But but the reason for that is that they are based in the US and the US is a litigious society. So what's happened is that they are getting sued for their inability or they're having court cases about for their inability to demonstrate the pure ESG compliance in or out. And I was in the US last week um, and I had a, a lot of meetings with a lot of the US banks and they are in a similar predicament. So they're in a predicament where they want to drive a sustainable fin finance or an ESG agenda, but because of the nature of the society in which they operate, where they're getting potential legal action against them, it's causing this kind of hiatus where they don't really know how to go forward with it so until there's specifically agreed global regulations and frameworks, as you suggest, that everybody agrees to, um, that people can work forward with, um, there's going to be this kind of noise in the system. But I think what we must be careful of is, you know, that is the U.S. And, and the U.S. is always a unique animal. You know, there's a lot of work being done in, in Europe. There's a lot of work being done in, in Asia and other parts of the, of, of, of the globe that is still trying to drive kind of this ESG sustainable finance agenda. We must be careful not to get caught up in the kind of uh, the, the noise that's coming out of the US is, is my view on this. Mm. Thanks, Nigel. And I mean, this is the same US where the government has just committed $7 billion of grant funding uh, for the development of seven green hydrogen hubs that are going to drive different hydrogen use cases to to try and help them decarbonize their economy, right? So equally, we've seen a very strong response from the US government, the incumbent administration, um, that actually helps to, to drive these goals. Now, Ravi, I am concerned that you are, are, are about to fall asleep um, not because of your facial expression, but just of the direction <laughs> of travel that the, that the conversation has taken. So um, if I can can then come back um, to you just around the YES um, scheme, um, I think you were quite specific in, in your earlier introduction of YES 
um, around the role that it plays in supporting, um, I think, the mining charter, um, job creation, um, helping companies with their ESG goals. Um, I'd like to just add two questions um, from the audience um, to that. And the first one is from Justin Mule where he says it sounds like a fantastic initiative and the numbers are absolutely inspiring. Um, what is it that you do around um, ensuring the longevity of those jobs um, so that they carry over for longer than the, the 12 months of, of the initial initiative? And then Anthony Madden is so excited about this. He wants to know whether it's exclusive to South Africa or if there are synergies with mining companies operating elsewhere in Africa that are, are um, possible. And just a reminder to unmute yourself. Yeah, no, thanks, Andrew. No, no, I'm, I'm not uh, getting bored. Um, you know, uh, I, I, I'm just looking to dive in there and uh, get on the dance floor uh, figuratively, pleased to know. Um, yeah, look, so I, I'll come to this question, but maybe also just to deal with bigger, some of the bigger issues, because I think uh, the question about whether there should be a regulate, uh, sort of a global regulatory standard setting process, I think, uh, I, I would think that's a very important thing. And I think a second theme is, even while that is happening, uh, a second theme, which is, which is critical is how you build trust in what is already being done, right? So maybe let me come to that as a bit of a theme and I'll end up with the questions and answers questions which you raised. So, you know, when we set up the Green Fund back a few years ago when I had a different, uh, when I was doing work with a developer bank and I was, we, 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 everyone was so excited about a thing back then called uh, uh, biomass. It was a big part of everyone's portfolio and biomass. It's like, oh yeah, it's be biomass. And then someone said, you know, biomass looks like it's a lot of logging and chopping down the forests are slipping in there. And I was like, oh, dear, we better un undo those portfolios. And then you got to select out. I think it goes to the greenwashing point. You know, you, you kind of have to know what's in the package because there were good green, green portfolios and bad ones pretending to be good. And you needed to know the difference. The same thing we find in the jobs programs is where people self-report, well, that's okay, but self-reporting is not the same as when someone else, third party checks, say, oh, this is what it is. You actually, it wasn't the person serving tea to your mother that you claimed was a job in the same way that Joanne and I might have a drone pilot working as a commercial drone pilot. Yeah. It's not to say someone shouldn't serve tea to your mother, but it'll be good to know because I'll put that in a different category. So I think uh, just just to get around to you, there, there, there are different types of ESG programs that every organization must do what they can do. But I would want to know which are the good ones from my perspective because I am building a network of the good ones. So let's just say we do a 12-month full-time job and just to link it to that answer, most of the people at the end of the program end up in a permanent or contract job. So that's how we measure like what happened to the person after the 12 months with us. Did they end up working for Anglo-American or running their own business? We at the moment have 45%, which is the highest. And then 15% of people set up their own business. And then and so on. And the other thing in longevity we do is we, we try to put people into industries that are future facing. So if you become a drone pilot, you would not just be helpful to yourself, but you'll be helpful to your community and the country needs more drone pilots for horticulture and security and form industries. So it's a good thing to do. It's not like you've been employed making typewriters. Um, so so that and and to that point, we're talking about the rest of Africa, we've just launched with Microsoft now the largest artificial intelligence skills hub of 300,000 people. Basically, our alumni in our next three years uh, intake all get trained, either you end up as a, someone from a rural area, but you're working in shop right warehousing, but you're aware of how AI is gonna affect warehousing. So that's good, level one. Level two, maybe uh, myself and Sarah, you know, we both use ChatGPT4 and uh, DALI and uh, and the mid-journey, you know, we kind of use it, but then you'll get to the thing called AI prop, you just get better at prompts and all the science around prompts and tech and so on. 
And we have a few thousand people who come through who actually are developers. And then they go into AI 900, which is a certified Microsoft uh, AI course. So you get, now you're a qualified expert. So it's a kind of a triangle, but it's good. But you want Africa to have more of those people because that's the way the world is going in all industries. So that's how you're trying to, that's how we're trying to do it. But we don't do, going back to how we, we, we want to mesh the good. If there are people, all doing DFI work, which can link to us. And so we're producing all these drone pilots. Where do they go? Who's who's supporting their business? We don't. So we want to tie up with the ESD program that uh, Joanne is talking about. So, but we want to work with them. But so that's it makes sense. And, oh, and by the way, can't they go and support some agricultural program in some other part of the ESG network? So we're almost on our own developing well, we, you know, with, with our friends, like an ESG trusted network. So, yes, there must be standards and all of that globally that have to come through. They can do that. But I think as South Africa, there's a good opportunity, or maybe the rest of Africa as well, to build up these networks and pull all our pieces together, not overcomplicated and engage with you know, Elon Musk and all that kind of stuff, the, the crazy part of the world. But there are things we can do to really lead in certain portfolios of ESG. And I think that's, you know, so we, the, the bird and the stone argument comes in, you know, we can do. Uh, we don't talk about birds and stones in that phrase here, but okay. you know we can we can solve our problems at the same time be a leader in ESG solutions, and I think that's kind of flexible uh, thing. But it it comes from the point I thought Melanie was making, which I think is very important. At the end, I need uh, to have trust in your rating because I want to connect with everyone who's four stars. And at the moment, we do all that work our own, on our own. But it'd be nice if there was a way to have that system uh, for ourselves. Yeah. Ravi, thank you, thank you so much. And I think Melanie, that that brings us back to you. Um, so I'm going to combine my question um, with one that we received from Landiwe Mashlangu, um, in the audience. Um, the social pillar. Um, as you've mentioned, has been a critical pillar um, in ESG. So how do you think South Africa um, compares to other jurisdictions? And Landiwe is, you know, sort of commenting on labour impacts, mining community impacts, and asking whether there are best practices that have emerged for you which you can share and which would feed into that relative view on South Africa as compared to other jurisdictions. I know that you guys, for example, are in Papua New Guinea as well. Yeah, yeah thank you, Landy, for, for the question. And yes, um, I'm going to try to answer it. I'll, I'll just cover context first around uh, social and then I'll get to Landy's question on labour and best practices. Um, so, yes, Harmony operates in three different jurisdictions, South Africa, Papua New Guinea, and Australia. And, and our co social context and social dynamics are very different. And so, like Sarah says, your responses and your interventions have got to be tailored to accommodate these nuances um, and these differences. I think social in South Africa, just by virtue of our history and the scale of um, social challenges of poverty and unemployment and inequality, all of the things that Ravi has mentioned uh, about our country, has forced businesses like ours to, to roll up our sleeves and really amplify efforts at S over the years. Um, so we've been doing S in the mining industry for a long time. Um, and, and I think um, we've gained a lot of experience. We've learned the good, the bad, the ugly. Um, and, and in, through all of these experience, experiences, I think we've also landed on some leading practices and in social integration and social development. Um, you know, when Ravi talks, it's, it's just so enlightening because these are the sorts of things that um, is really going to position our country um, to, to turn the tides for the future. And just listening to that and listening to how we can integrate it and promote partnerships is, is absolutely crucial. So there's a lot of leading practices and hubs of, um, of wins that we can superimpose elsewhere. 
Um, I think what we've also learned to do and, and have developed over, over the years is stuff like BE and localization, concepts that are very important to uplifting um, uh, and changing some of the injustices in our country. So, so South Africa really has taken a leading practice. And I think other things that we've sort of learned along the way is a deep-seated re respect for working within the culture of our host communities and governments and to work together to, to build partnerships, align goals and aspirations, um, and a sense of coexisting. And, and sometimes we get it really right and sometimes we get it wrong and then we've got to go back to the drawing board and, and reestablish the trust and, and work on um, aligning. But um, from a South African context, and I think this is how I see it contrasting to other jurisdictions. I think in South Africa, due to the sheer levels of poverty and unemployment, people's needs are very basic. Um, you know, they want employment. We've talked a lot about employment now with the YES concept, education, water, food, health care. And so our solutions when solving for these, uh, you know, we work towards delivering some of these basic needs. I think what we're also seeing in South Africa is that these needs are deepening and communities are turning more and more to us and for, for support and, and assistance. And, and sometimes our support has to go beyond what we contracted to, beyond the SLP, beyond the mining charter, um, so that we can take our communities along with us as well. And, and sometimes our efforts go beyond just the community. You know, we're investing in uh, capacitating institutions like Munich so that they can actually deliver on, on basic services. And I think we, we would find a lot of these situations prevailing in developing economies. I think Sarah mentioned we're both at London in Darba and next to G, I think the next pressing issue um, and call by African leaders were for us to put social as a key consideration in the ESG con uh, conversation for the continent. I think that uh, theme would come through um, in many developing economies. Um, in contrast, though, when you look at more prosperous economies, tier one economies where we operate in, their social context and dynamics are very different to ours. So there isn't that level of poverty and starvation, and and most of their level one needs already met, right? Uh, their government has mm -hmm. has implemented measures, and and so the pressure sort of lifts. Um, and I think uh, Nigel may have alluded to it. You see a little more balance across the ESG theme there. Um, perhaps even a stronger bias sometimes in Global North for G&E, uh, geopolitical, climate change issues, where S is still very paramount for us, very, very necessary. Um, I'm going to answer the question on labour impacts and best practices. I think, you know, the mining sector in South Africa, and I'm just going to use Harmony as an example, you wanted to, to, uh, to just understand best practice a little. I think the mining sector in South Africa has um, has really uh, played a significant part in supporting um, with job security and job creation. I think from the perspective of institutions like ours, where we have built our business really on developing and investing in assets that would not have uh, continued had uh, Harmony not acquired it. So Harmony taken assets that were on the brink of closure as our modus operandi, and, and you'd know it well, Sandra. Uh, we invested in it, we extended life of mine, we kept the operations open, we kept people employed in communities for longer than um, than we, you know, than, than would have been in the case of, of other um, companies holding the assets. So, so that in itself is already a good practice. And I think you see a lot of intent to invest in building up our all bodies, in exploring and exploiting it and really contributing to uh, the economy. And I think it calls for a good deal of partnership in order to unlock some of those things. Uh, Joanne Nigel, I think, um, you know, there's, there's that call for integration amongst all of the various sectors to promote the mining sector. That said, you know, there are instances where operations or assets lead, uh, do reach the end of their geological life and uh, we've got to make some tough decisions around uh, continuing to operate it. I think in most instances, and I think the industry is very, very um, scrupulous about trying to ensure that we protect jobs as much as possible where we can. 
Um, and where we can't protect jobs, I think, you know, bearing in mind that we've got to run sustainable, resilient businesses, we've got to make sure that job losses are done in a very um, systematic, coordinated and careful manner, respecting the dignity, managing the impact, managing outcomes. I think that's where it's so important to have alternative training and skilling programs in place. To Ravi's point, to Joanne's point, let's start developing people for alternative economies. Let's set up those alternative economies. So when we reach end of geological life, um, we can feed into other economies. So look, the industry goes through its tough times, but really uh, we try very hard to make sure that we buffer impact as best we can. Harmony itself has closed operations in the last few years. We've closed it in such a manner that we didn't have job losses. We, um, you know, it's, it's top of the agenda of every um, C-suite within the mining sector to protect and preserve as best we can and where we can't. Um, we're very, very careful about how we manage the social dynamics around it. Melanie, thank you so much. Um, you know, the audience will know we've probably got about 10 minutes left of conversation and then we need to start wrapping up. So, Nigel, I think we, we're hearing a lot about the positive impacts of ESG, um, you know, sort of policies and especially when Melanie describes the way that you can really mindfully implement these policies in a way that um, prolongs, sustains and, and promotes um, the well-being of, of the society within which we operate. Um, from a financing perspective, how do you see a strong ESG, ERSG, esprit de corps within an organization open up opportunities? And what do those opportunities look like when a, when a company is fully embracing this process? Thanks. And, think, and you're yeah. welcome here to punt R&B and some of the deals that you've had. <laughs> okay. we, can, we can use one or two examples. So I think, I mean, first of all, it kind of goes to that kind of beyond compliance question that came through earlier. You know, and I think people need to understand that, you know, there is compliance and then there's beyond compliance. And I think the world's moved to this kind of beyond compliance. So when banks and investors start looking at ESG, you know, we start looking at very much like a transition lens. So, for example, you look at a company or you look at an asset. Is it Paris lined? Are there net zero commitments? Are there decarbonization plans? Are there short, medium and long term targets? You know, that might be science uh, science based. And these are relevant to the mining company because in having those in place, you're able to attract a larger pool of investors and lenders. So in other words, it allows you to crowd in additional lenders and investors um, that are going to look at, you know, your 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 company, whether it's from a debt or an equity perspective in a favorable way. You also, you know, if you look and I'm bringing a couple of different themes here together is now if you look at disclosure. So if you look at effective disclosure, if you look at qualitative, quantitative disclosure, you know, we've moved away from just purely um, uh, qualitative disclosure. We've moved towards quantitative disclosures with external insurance. And I think this was mentioned earlier. I think Melanie had mentioned it earlier. She was quite proud of, you know, the fact that she's scoring quite well from an ESG rating perspective. To the extent you score well from an ESG rating perspective, investors do look upon that favorably. So they look at those scores. They look at what your analytics score is, rightly or wrongly, and, you know, taking the noise into consideration. Um, and, and they look could say, well, actually, you're scoring particularly well. Therefore, we're more likely to invest in, in this specific company or, or not invest in the specific company. There's also, you know, if you look kind of forward at the more opportunity side, if you look at the proactive side, you know, there was a mention earlier around kind of the critical minerals. There's the critical minerals of, of the transition, copper, cobalt, lithium, etc. You know, these are key to transition to the extent that mining companies are moving into these type of minerals. They're also looked at favor. They looked at favorably by investors. They looked at banks. You know, for example, if you get more than 30% of your revenue from these type of critical minerals, you know, there's sometimes a different lens that banks will look at because it's seen that you're more kind of transition aligned. Then there's the ability to raise kind of green loans, you know, whether it might be the installation of renewable energy, energy efficiencies, emission reductions, you know, that come with some type of pricing benefit up front. Generally, what we would do is provide a, a pricing up, uh, pricing benefit upfront for that. And then there's sustainability link loans. And I think, you know, as mentioned earlier, and the sustainability linked loans are these performance incentive loans where there are specific um, KPIs and these are measured every year or every two years, whatever it might be. And to the extent that you hit these specific KPIs or these targets, you get a pricing benefit. So essentially, 
what financial institutions are doing is are they incentivizing companies and mining companies included to essentially align their financial strategy and and their sustainability strategy and i think this is quite important because it's moving away from operations and it's moving towards strategy now aligning financial strategy and sustainability strategy and then also for ravi's benefit i mean it's it's, it's the social element as well it's the just element i mean that, that's becoming increasingly important and i agree um, with what Melly was saying earlier that the social element is very important on the continent with within the african continent investors are very interested in that so there's an ability to include kind of social loans and services. So if I look at what we've done within within RMB, you know, if you look at renewable energy, we've provided um, Melanie and the team at Harmony with kind of um, renewable energy finance for a 30 megawatt project. You know, we mandated lead arranger for a 15 year uh, 15 year project. We've done very similar for, for Sabanya where they've got a wheeled operation um, and we provided a 15 year kind of uh, loan to them as well for an 89 megawatt project. You know, from an equity side, we were involved in um, in, in the, the acquisition of, of WindLab by Sariti. So Sariti and Massimong, you know, we were one of the equity partners in that as well. And essentially, that's that's a portfolio of about 23 renewable energy projects across not only South Africa, but also also Kenya. You know, then also moving into sustainability linked loans. We've, you know, executed loans for, for gold fields, um, for Harmony as well. You know, and, and sustainability linked KPIs are, are sometimes Things that people are interested about. So, for example, in the gold fields one, uh, it was very much aligned to the 2030 ESG target. So, again, it's aligning to a strategy. It's aligning your sustainability strategy to your financial strategy. Um, essentially, looking at kind of 30% women representation, 80% of water consumed um, that will be recycled or reused, and reducing your net one, uh, your scope one and two emissions by 30%. And potentially, you know, absolute emissions about fifty percent. Similarly, we've done a sustainability linked bond for for Pan African resources, also with with specific KPIs. So you can see that there's specific growth in sustainable finance in the mining industry. Um, and 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 for me, we're just at the start of it. I think there's a lot more that's going to come. There's a lot more products that we are looking at that will be relevant: carbon trading, carbon finance, natural capital products that we're also developing. That I think you know are going to become much more mainstream. Um, in the future as time goes on. Thank you, Nigel. And I, I think that addresses to some extent um, questions posed by Warren Smith and Amber Maseko um, around the role that renewable energy will play um, in the overall um, ESG process and also in funding. So Sarah, we've, we've got a couple of minutes left. Um, I have a question for you. Um, and it's also kind of come through um, from the audience, um, from Rory Sung Malebia, Andrew McDonald. How are we doing on reporting? Um, and specifically, um, they were interested in the use of sort of the SAMREC, SAMVAL codes um, and the JSE's reporting guidelines. Um, Nigel also mentioned this transparency in terms of the substance of what companies are reporting. Are we, are we saying enough? Are we saying the right things? Are we saying them to appropriate standards? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a good question. I think, you know, within South Africa, um, there's a lot being done. There's still a lot to do. Um, you know, going back to what Melanie said, um, mining's been at the forefront of ESG for a while. Mining in South Africa, probably ahead of peers again in the US and Europe, primarily because they haven't been dealing with the scarcity in the same social context that, that we have. But I think, you know, we do need to leverage and show that better. Um you know, done well and responsibly, mining is a massive lever for development and socioeconomic upliftment. Um, and that's critical because, you know, if you're going to win the hearts, of my, hearts and minds of the next generation who are going to be your workers and going to be in, your investors, you've got to show them that because they have different expectations. They're asking different questions. They want to know that they're working for a company that has positive impact. They want to put their money there as well. Um, so... You know, and, that, and that's why there's demand. Um, so that's we need to be doing more of that, just telling that story better, I think. Um, and I'm, I'm going to go back about probably 15 minutes in the conversation when we're talking about the SDGs. One of the companies we work with have sort of, you know, last year when we were putting together this US report, um, we're having discussions around all these three and four letter acronyms, GRI, SASB, um, IFRIS is coming through now. 
and said, well, yeah, we are doing all of this and we've been reporting on all of this for a while. How do we do it differently now? Because this is feeling tick boxy. This is feeling compliancy. So what we did was say, no, we're putting the SDGs as the reporting spine. So, you know, there's wonderful and good natural alignment between what GRI is asking, what SASB is asking. They feed into a number of those KPIs. But we framed the story and the narrative around SDGs and the company then actually said, and it's part of their strategy, you know, how we measure our success as a business now also is fundamentally linked to the value we deliver to society. So that's why we're putting them at the core, not just of our strategy, but at the core of our reporting. So, Sarah, thank you very much for that. And, and Joanne, I'm... I'm going to ask you to um, just um, close out the conversation um, for us today, um, if you would, with a few remarks. If you had to talk about any limitations that are hindering companies from doing better on the ESG front, um, from sort of them more fulsomely um, embracing um, all of the issues that we've been discussing today. Yeah. What would you say those limiting factors are? Thanks so much. And I think we've, we've touched on the complexity that has been created in this space because there's so much regulatory compliance and there's all these new concepts and there's different standards. So I think... One of the biggest limitations is trying to, even if a company has got a mindset of impact and wanting to do the right thing for future generations, they have to, they're so caught up in chasing the compliance of the moment that it's quite difficult to drive that alignment. So I do think that there's a need for greater simplicity in what we're seeking to achieve. I think one of my big worries in um, ESG and all the additional aspects that get added and all the new frameworks that get introduced is that this becomes an opportunity for consultants to assist in reporting as opposed to an opportunity for impact that we're trying to achieve in e and <laughs> I'm not so, hurt, Jan. I'm not hurt by that remark. <laughs> There's room for everyone, but we just need to ensure that the the outcomes are the right outcomes. So I almost feel we're at a stage that you know, everyone's chasing best practice. I think it's time for next practice. So how do we get back to the simplicity of achieving the right thing and using the tools as a means to which we can achieve it? And I think that's, you know, that's far easier said than done. But I do think that um, in order to accelerate... Um, access to the opportunity of ESG, because I keep wanting to reinforce ESG is not a cost of compliance. ESG provides the potential to reframe the conversation around transparent, sustainable, positively impactful value chains that we're seeking to achieve. And I think it presents an opportunity for the country to fundamentally differentiate and transform our mining and manufacturing sector. And it's bigger than just mining. I really do think that we need to, to look at how we use mining as a catalyst for growth of our economy. And I do think that requires um, an industry-wide approach to finding simplicity and meaning in what we're seeking to achieve. I think it's a transformational opportunity for the, the country. Um, and it's something we need to solve as a collective. Uh, because if each company tries to solve it alone, we're going to end up with more complexity as opposed to the answers that drive impact. Thanks. And thanks so much. And Shannon, um, with one and a half minutes to spare, and just uh, we've managed to hold on to most of our 400 plus participants um, for the webinar today. Um, back to you just to close us out. Thanks very much, Sandra. Um, I really enjoyed this discussion. And um, with that, it does bring us to the end of the webinar. I'd like to say thank you to you, Sandra, for enabling a robust and engaging discussion on this important topic affecting the mining industry. Also, thank you so much to our panelists, Melanie Naidu for Mark from Harmony Gold, Sarah Cooper from Digby Wells Environmental Consultants, Joanne Bate from the Industrial Development Corporation, Ravi Naidu from Youth Employment Service, and Nigel Beck from Rand Merchant Bank. Also, thank you very much to our sponsors, Harmony Gold, 
Partners in Performance, Rand Merchant Bank, Youth Employment Service, Digby Wells Environmental Consultants, and Ukwazi Mining Services for their support in making this webinar possible. And finally, thank you so much to the attendees for taking the time to join us for this discussion on ESG in mining, and also for participating in the Q&A. We hope you found it engaging and learned something new. We've had an amazing year of webinars in 2023, and we really look forward to more next year. Our first webinar for the new year will focus on South Africa's energy outlook for 2024. And it takes place on the 24th of January, 2024 at 2 p.m. It's a lot of 24s, so just remember all the 24s. The link to register will be shared um, shortly. And the recording of today's webinar will be sent to you in due course. Uh, we unfortunately weren't able to stream it live to YouTube because of technical dif difficulties, but we will send you that information shortly. And if you have any additional questions, please be in touch. You can reach us at shannon at creamamedia.co.za. Thank you so very much for your time and goodbye.